God's purpose in the creation of souls. So the soul longs for God. That much is clear. But we can ask the question another way, too. We can flip it around. Does God likewise long for us? Or to say it yet another way, why is it that God created such a beautiful universe and inhabited this theater of glory with sentient beings that desire Him? First, God did not create us because He was lonely. You ask the common Christian on the street why God made the world, and they will likely tell you it is because God was friendless and wanted to be loved. For them, God is like a forlorn child that wishes his toys could come to life. But creation because of loneliness has to be rejected on the theological basis that it completely fails to reckon with the doctrine of the Trinity. God eternally exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and this divine reality is entirely sufficient for God's relational purposes. God was never lonely. Secondly, God did not create because he got bored. When I was a child, my most common complaint was, I'm bored. But I quickly learned not to utter these words. My mother could easily think of something for me to do, and her assigned chores were often far worse than my boredom. God is such an excellent and beautifully glorious being that he doesn't get bored. He doesn't run out of things to do. He doesn't twiddle his thumbs. God doesn't flip through the channels, wasting eternity away. So why then? To help resolve this question, we do well to turn to the writings of the men who knew God intimately. One such man is the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah ministered to the people of Israel just prior to the exile, when God's people were battered by Assyria, then utterly conquered by Babylon, from 740 to 680 B.C. He served as God's mighty prophet to call his people back to repentance, back into a relationship with their Maker. Isaiah teaches on the purpose of creation as one of his dominant themes. He writes, Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 7. Aha! So we pick up a key word here that appears again and again when we talk about creation. God's glory. The overflow of God's greatness is somehow connected to his purposes in making a habitable world for intelligent creatures. Again, the prophet writes, I provide water to give my people, my chosen, the people I formed for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 21. Now we are getting somewhere. Creation is designed somehow for intelligent and volitional creatures to respond to the greatness of God with adoration and the required and appropriate response is indeed praise and worship. Here we must be very careful. We cannot say that God needed to be praised, as though he were not complete without it. We all know people that are like that. They need to be praised. God is not like a woman lacking in self-esteem who has to ask everyone she knows if they like her new haircut. He does not lack confidence, as though he needed to make beings that could constantly tell him how great he is. As Paul proclaims in Romans chapter 11, verses 33 through 35, O oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are his judgments, and how inscrutable his ways! For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? The rhetorical question is clear enough. We cannot give God anything that he hasn't first given us. Yes, he is worthy to be praised. Yes, we are commanded to worship him. But it is not as though he was lacking something that needed to be satisfied by the worship of men and angels. Not only that, but our worship doesn't add anything to God's glory either, for it is impossible to improve on perfection. Nothing can be added to the infinite to raise it higher still. This is a humbling thought. Though God can do anything and everything for us, we can do nothing for Him. Living for a Purpose Many of you are no doubt asking, What does this matter to me? Why should I care about anything you've written so far about Hebrew words and dead philosophers? Because unless you understand that you were made for the very purpose of savoring and reflecting the glory of God back to Him, 
your life will never fulfill its divinely intended potential. You will be like an object that never does what it was created to do. You will be like an axe whose blade never tastes wood, a car that never sees the open road, a bottle of wine left unopened and ignored at a wedding feast. There are many people today walking around hollow and empty. Their lives are meaningless and shallow. They wander aimlessly or simply waste away their lives doom-scrolling on their phones. They are spiritual zombies, ever seeking but never finding. They sense an acute hunger and thirst in their lives for meaning, and they can never obtain it. Have you ever thought about the fact that you might not have existed at all? It is possible that God could have created a universe that didn't include you in it. Time could be ticking on without you, and no one would have ever known you were gone, because they wouldn't know a you to miss. And yet, God, in his baffling mercy, decided to make you. He willed that your soul exist. You didn't do anything to cause yourself to be here. And therefore, if you are going to go on living, you had better figure out why you are here. As Isaiah has told us very clearly, I formed them for myself that they might declare my praise. Isaiah chapter 43 verse 21. Every day you live without doing that, you are annulling your very reason for existing in the first place.